Yes, thank you, Lord. Amen. I want you guys to go ahead and sit down. I've got a video clip I want you to, to watch real quick. This is a guy named um, Francis Chan. And he is, uh, to me, he's one of the best teachers in the country. Uh, Francis comes from, um, he, he had a mega church. I mean, multi thousands and thousands of people. And he just began to seek the Lord. And he says, You know, this, this is not enough. This is not enough. Yeah, they were doing church. They had big things going on, a lot of stuff going on. He says, But we're really not doing what Jesus wanted us to do. I mean, church is a great thing, but it's not about our seating capacity. It needs to be about our sending capacity. And Francis resigned this church. Just boom, just, just quit. And he went home to spend time with his family. And so what he does now, he goes out and just in neighborhoods and just goes to see people and start sharing the love of Christ. Because he felt like that's what God really wanted him to do. In the meantime, the church has grown. Not because he left, but because the spirit of the people wanted to get behind that. And uh, he's, he's got some really good points I want us to look at. I could have, you know copied what he was doing and then do it but it wouldn't be as good so he's going to ask some questions i want you guys to answer them out loud i mean we'll all know on there so can you run that clip well, i want to do an exercise here okay i want you to complete these phrases out loud if you can okay and just kind of all say them out loud together rudolph the red-nosed reindeer Good. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. Good. I can't get no. Wow, we all knew that one. That's the way. Uh huh, uh huh. Good. Good. Hey, Mickey, you're so fine. Good. Hit me, baby. Oh, I'm glad you know that one. Um, here's a very important one, too. Jingle bells, Batman smells. <laughs> so good. Wow. <laughs> plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Good. If it doesn't get all over the place. Melts in your mouth. Like a good neighbor? <laughs> good, good, good. Um, help, I've fallen. <laughs> good. Thy word have I hidden in my heart? Good, all right. Wasn't sure we get that one. Sanctify them by the truth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm glad you got that first one, but, but it's, it's, it's just interesting how I, I was just thinking about these phrases that I've just known my whole life. I, I started thinking back to songs like from junior high and high school where I knew every single word to them. And I'm going, all this stuff that I've memorized, why? Because we've spent so much time hearing it, you know, looking at it, focusing on it to where we've got these statements in our head, we can just roll them out, and it's like, wow, if we could do that with Scripture. If, we, if someone could just start verses and we just, because we meditated on all day, gosh, how, how awesome our lives would be. How amazing our lives would be. I, you know, that, that verse, that, that verse I want to put on the screen that, that we quoted, Psalm 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And, and, and first of all, let me say, that's so encouraging to see so many of you could just, boom, yeah, that, that's, that's on the top of my tongue. I, I, just, I just know it. I know that verse because th this has been done in front of high school students. You know, in a, I remember being in a gym where there was just like 3,000 high schoolers and they're just rattling everything off and then boom, we, we said this at the beginning of this verse and it was dead silent. And it's like, wow, not a single person in here could finish that? You, you know, because it's like, well, what do we dwell on? What do we focus on? And yet the, the, the verse says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
that there's something about having God's word, there's some sort of power that when we can really memorize it and internalize it, it's really our only strength, our only hope to not sin against God. So many people live these weak Christian lives where you just feel like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, you know, flopping from Christianity back to my sin, back to God, back and forth, back and forth. And, and they go, I don't get it. I don't understand why. And the Bible says so clearly, well, it's because you're not meditating on God's word. You're not hiding it in your heart. You're not really memorizing it. I mean, if those stats are true, that the average Christian in, a, in America, or average Christian in the world really, is only spending like 10 minutes with God and four hours watching television, and then we wonder why we're weak? You, you know, it's just like, well, yeah, I don't understand why I'm tempted. I don't understand why I feel so weak. Well, could it be possibly that the four hours versus the 10 minutes, you know, is starting to outweigh a little bit? You know, and yet the scriptures say, gosh, if we could just meditate on his word, if we could internalize it, if we could hide it in our hearts, that's what's going to keep us from sin. I, I think if, if God had us turn in a timesheet this week, okay, if you had to turn one in right now, a timesheet, this is how many minutes I spent with you, this is how many minutes I spent watching television, and you handed it to God right now, what would that look like? Now, now you know why I let him do it. He just did such a good job on that. Um, back in black. Okay. Nobody got that one. That's why you let him do it. That's why I let him do it. Yeah. Back in black. I was just trying an ACD song, song if anybody knew it. Okay. She got it. Yeah. Huh? All right. Yeah. So what we're talking about is, is intimacy. Can you pull me down just a little bit? I feel like I'm booming right here. Uh, this is the fourth part of Not a Fan, and I'm not sure how long this series is going to go, but I have a feeling it's going to keep going for quite a while because I'm just, I mean, we're just now beginning to um, uh, just pierce the, the, the beginning of this message about not being a fan. I had not thought about that. I had realized it myself that I had really become a fan of God and not so much, uh, you know, a follower. A lot of us are fans. But today we're going to talk about the knowledge of Him or intimacy with Him. There's two completely different things. A lot of us know a lot of things about a lot of people, and you need to turn those lights back on too, or it's going to look weird uh, on the video just for the heck of it. Thank you. Um, there's a difference between knowledge and intimacy. Do you agree with that? You can know a lot of things about a lot of people, but there's a difference between knowing a lot of things about a lot of people than being intimate with a lot of people, you know? And so we have to look at what's the definition of knowledge? A lot of us have knowledge, but not all of us have intimacy. Knowledge is says acquaintance with facts and truths or principles as from study or investigation um, knowledge of many things. So it's just acquaintance with facts. A, a lot of us may have facts about Jesus, you know, because we've heard of the things that he's done. We know that, that he's Jesus, but there's a difference between knowing who he is. The Bible even says that the devil even knows who Jesus is. You know, remember the sons of Sceva? When they were like trying, you know, casting demons out, and then these demons come out and said, "Now Paul, I know, and 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 uh, uh, Peter, I know, but but I don't know who you are." And then the demon came out and whooped him, big time. Let's look at the uh, definition of intimacy. Intimacy is the state of being intimate, a close, familiar, and usually affectionate or loving personal relationship with another person or group. Why did we sing the songs we did today? Because I messed Tony up because he had a whole nother set list going until I sent him the, my message t t last night. I, just to let you guys know, I don't normally have a message together until Saturday. It's just been my pattern. I can't change it. And so Tony had a lot of nice songs picked up and none of them went with this message. <laughs> so, 
So he, he, he changed that, you know. And, that, and that, that last song we sing, Your Love is Amazing. And that is, is a song of intimacy. That we can enter into that place and feel the loving arms of Christ around us. And whenever we give him our praise and our worship, we, we move into a place of knowledge, into a place of intimacy. If you've ever had an intimate relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, you, you'll never forget it. And if you lose it, you'll always want it back. And, and uh, God doesn't move away from us, but we move away from him many times. And that's where that, that intimacy slips away. Do you want your kids to you know, listen to you, just, you know, demand that they love you. You need to tell me that you love me. Okay, Dad, I love you. Jeez, get off my back, you know? Or you don't demand it, and it comes up and puts his arm up and says, Paul, Paul. And you pick him up, and he lays his head on your shoulder and hugs you. It's like, ah, oh, that is so nice. See, I know Skyler. I know him as a person. I know him as a, as a, as a kid. But, but I have an intimate relationship with him. When he sees me, I have immediate love just wells out from me to him. And he puts his arms out and says, Paul, Paul. And I pick him up. And there's not, listen, a billion dollars can't pay for that type of intimacy. And when you get to the place with Christ that you've moved to this place from head knowledge and moved into the place of heart knowledge, that you can actually feel the Spirit of God when He comes around. That you can taste and almost smell the goodness of God around you because He's just so loving and so precious. He wants us to be intimate with Him. A lot of us can... In the church, we kind of, we want to be a fan, but not a follower because it, it demands something of us. It costs something of us. We talked about that last week. That moving from that place of just being a, a cheerleader to becoming a player is a big change. And the difference between knowing God and knowing Christ and moving to that place of intimacy is another big game changer. I know a lot of people that have a lot of head knowledge of Christ, have a lot of head knowledge of the Bible. I know some people that are lost as a goose that could quote you the Bible inside and out, ten ways from Sunday. They have a lot of knowledge, 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 but knowledge by itself is no good. We know in the Word says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Good, I'll stick with the Scriptures. <laughs> Dirty deeds. Okay. <laughs> oh. Now, what was that scripture I just gave? Do what? Truth will set you free. And that's right. The truth will set you free. But what we're talking about, the truth, you have to have the knowledge of the truth to be set free. But even the knowledge of the truth can't set you free. And what I like to say is, it's not the truth that will set you free. It's not the truth that you know that will set you free. It's the truth that you do. I mean, the Word of God in, in, in Isaiah says that, you know, by His stripes we were healed. It says in the New Testament that where two agree is touching anything, it shall be done for them. It says in the Word that whenever you pray, whatever you ask, believe that you have received it and it shall be yours. You may know that truth, but until you act out in that truth, in that truth, then that knowledge does you no good. It, it says that in, the, in the word that he bore our sicknesses, he took our diseases, our transgressions were laid upon him. He took our punishment. And it says that he took away the sins of the world. We realize that Jesus took on every sin that could ever possibly take place in human life on that cross and it was nailed to the cross that it could be taken care of once we call on his name and say Jesus 
your mind. And that means that everything that he did on the cross, if he was, if he was on the cross and it wasn't complete, he should have not said it's finished. That means there was more to be done. And, and, and many times we want to put Jesus in a box and say, well, I've got to do this for that word to come to pass. No. No, you've got to call on the name of Jesus Christ for his word to come to pass. Then you have to walk out in it because the word of God says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because you must believe that he is. You have to believe that he exists. You must believe that God is. And it says that he rewards, though, he's a rewarder of those who diligently, who, who seek after him. The Bible talks about God going to and fro, just looking for a place to bless somebody. But many of us don't, wouldn't know what to do with the blessing if we got it. How many knows what the, uh, the uh, lottery's up to now? Really? Has anybody checked their tickets? <laughs> How much was it? Six hundred million. You haven't bought a ticket in a while. If anybody knows who it is, we'll be glad to. You know, they're in Florida. It could be your relatives. Thanks, Sue. Sue will be flying back in a, back in a Lear jet that she bought. But um, the word of God says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. God desires to bless us. And sometimes God's going to bless you by ways that the monies don't come from good places. We remember, I don't know how many people know the story of the, the couple that hit $800,000 here in Stagesville. And they wanted to give 10% or $80,000 to their church. And the church rejected it. Duh. <laughs> yeah. Well, but here's the sad thing about it. They didn't just reject the money. They rejected the people. And from what I understand, they're not even married anymore. Listen, when God wants to bless you, he's going to bless you. And when he says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, that means if the wicked wants to give you something, you take it and you thank God for it. It's all God's anyway. It's all God's anyway. That's like there was this lady, then she was always praising God and praying to God all the time. And her neighbor, he was an atheist. He couldn't stand her or anything. But, you know, all the time she would be praying. And one day she was praying and she, he was walking by and he heard her praying out loud. And she said, Lord God, she says, my cupboards are bare. I don't have any food. But Lord, I know that you said you will meet my needs according to your glorious riches in heaven. So I thank you, Lord, that this day that you're going to provide for me, not just a little, but in abundance, because your word is true. This old atheist heard that, so he went to the store immediately, bought about $200 worth of groceries, and come and, and set them on the door, and knocked on the door and went and hide in the bushes. And she came out and she saw that. She just started, praise you, God, just giving God the glory. I know that you would supply. You always do. You've never failed. You're always taking care of me. And that atheist jumped out. He said, you need to understand one thing, lady. He said, it wasn't your God that provided that food for you. It was me. She said, oh, Lord, that's even better. <laughs> said, you provided and made the devil pay for it. <laughs> So God may want to bless you by different means and don't ever turn away the blessing. Because God loves us and he wants intimacy with us. A lot of us have a struggle being intimate with God because we have a problem being intimate with one another. We don't want to let down our guard. We don't want to you know, open up and, and, and let people really see us. You know, when we get before God. You know when God speaks to me the most? Usually when I'm in the bathroom or in the shower. Because there I'm naked and not, and not ashamed, you know? You I mean, he'll get you at that moment there, you know? 
I never forget one day I was taking a shower and the Lord was speaking to me in my spirit, you know. I wouldn't hear in audible voices and all that stuff, but I know, I know that it says, you know, that my sheep will know my voice and, and they'll follow me. So I, I know when the Lord speaks to me. And he starts speaking to me and I'm taking a shower. And I'm like, whoa, Lord. I'm like covering myself up. I'm like, what, what are you, yeah, what are you doing? I said, it really doesn't help much, does it? You done seen everything you created it anyway. Yeah. But he, he, he wants our whole heart. Intimacy with God, if you're going to have intimacy with him, you've got to do it with your whole heart. And you've got to let down some barriers, barriers of hurt and woundness, woundedness that you have had in your life. And I'm not being specific and I'm not being political, but I had a friend of mine that was, you know, uh, a lesbian, whatever, and came to church. And I loved, I, listen, our doors are open. It's not about who you are. It's about who Jesus is, That's right. you know? And she finally, she didn't come and just said, you know, I just don't feel like I fit in there or everything. I'm like, well, number one, you never participated in anything we did. You know, and I'm like, and, and she's tried different churches, but everywhere she just doesn't feel she fits in. And I'm like, you know, if she would let down the wall of lesbianism and let the love come in and just be a person, you know, it's, listen, whatever you, God knows, you know, and only, and, and if, if God needs to change your heart, he'll do it. But the thing of it is, is that, that you can have struggles with sin in your life and still be intimate with God. Otherwise, Jesus' death on the cross was ridiculous. I mean, we, we, if he didn't destroy sin, and, and if we're not supposed to sin the minute we get saved, then we're all messed up. Because I've found myself that there's a good possibility I may sin before the day's over with. Not intentionally. You know, unless my wife, you know, gives on the bad side or something. <laughs> I'm just picking. She's sitting there. That's why I said that. Or, you're or I'm driving. Yes. That's the. Or, yeah. Or she's driving. That's even. That's just, she's a good driver. I let her drive all the time. I take a. I take quaaludes and just pass out. I'm good. No, I love, I love for her to drive. I put the seat back, turn the radio on, and I just sleep. I can go to sleep in like two minutes when somebody's driving. This has nothing to do with the message. There we go. Let's get back on track. Intimacy with God takes your whole heart. In Matthew 15, 8 through 9, it says this. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me. Teaching as doctrines and precepts of men. And a lot of us are into that place that we're going to be in church today. And, and a lot of people are going to be in church and we're going to hear vain repetitions. We're going to honor God with our mouths, but our heart's far from him. We're going to have teaching and doctrines that make us feel good. But did we have a relationship with Jesus? My prayer, my goal is that when you come here, yeah, I want you to have a good time. I want you to feel the love of Jesus Christ. But I don't want you to know me. I don't want you to know Tony, the worship leader, or anybody in here. I want you to know that you met Jesus today. That he spoke to my heart. There was something that God gave me to say that would, would reach in and minister to the place that you need ministering to. And he desires that. So much. John 4, 23 and 25 says this. It says, but an hour are coming, and now is, that when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is the Spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. 
This lady was asking, you know, where were we worshipped, you know, in the mountains and the hills, where we're going to worship. And he says, listen, there's an hour coming that, that it doesn't matter where you worship, but you're going to worship, us, uh, worship God in spirit and in truth. And because the Father seeks true worshipers, if the enemy can take your worship, he can take you down. If he can take the praise out of you, he can take everything out of you. Because the enemy will come at you and make you so angry, you'll be so distur- discouraged that you don't even want to talk to God. I don't, Lord, I don't, I don't want to pray. You know, or it's like when somebody says, well, let's just pray right now. And you're like, I don't want to pray. Well, we're going to pray anyway. Because the enemy doesn't want us to pray. But when we come together and pray, it breaks the yokes of the enemy. The hour is coming, and he's saying, and it's now. When is now? So what is God seeking now? True worshipers. Our worship doesn't come from our head. Okay. There's a lot of places you can go on Sundays and have a great performance. There is a complete difference between a great performance and worship. When there's performance, worship is not there. We've had, we've had people here before that have been great performers. I would rather have a worshiper that couldn't sing on key than a performer that could sing like Whitney Houston. But I'd rather have both, one that was a worshiper that sang like Whitney Houston. <laughs> if anybody wants to sign up for that program, that's, uh, yeah. Intimacy with God takes courage. It does take courage. It says in Luke seven thirty seven, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Imagine that. <laughs> when she learned... Uh, that he was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster uh, vial of perfume. Do you know what she did with that? Does anybody remember that story? She poured it on Jesus, anointed his head, and the tears fell on his feet, and she washed his feet with her hair. I want, to, I want to take you to this place where this woman is and who she is a little bit because I don't think we take that scripture to the heart of what really was going on here. When we see that here's a woman, it says, knowing the type of person she was, she was a sinner. And if you go on and begin, and I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to all the scripture, but she was a sinner. I'm assuming she was probably a prostitute. She took perfume, which was something that was very expensive, and she had it in an alabaster box, which also was a very expensive. I'm going to stretch here and, 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 and paint a picture that I may not be able to totally prove biblically, but, but, it, but I think it, it proves the heart of what was going on. I believe that this woman was, was a prostitute, and she had been used by men. Pretty much all of her life. She had a vial of perfume that was precious to her. was the most expensive thing out. And she had an alabaster box that she kept that in. Do you know what I believe why she had that? I don't think it was for her trade. Because remember Judas got upset. Well we could have sold that. And made some, you know, fed some hungry people. I think she was saving it for her wedding day. That she wanted true love. She wanted unmerited favor. She wanted someone to love her just for who she was. And she was saving that for that specific time. And she sees Jesus. And she hears Jesus. And she comes to the house. Intimacy with God doesn't hold anything back. It doesn't hold back your treasures. It doesn't hold back what you've been saving up. Luke 7, 38 says, And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet. And with her tears, 
and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Worship. Here is a woman that 